multi-millionaire lottery winner Abraham Shakespeare. He may well have been setting off a bizarre chain of events that would end with his murder. I don't know why you can, how you convinced him to give you everything without paying for it, but you did. had nothing to do with it, but I did not feel that way. When a lucky truck driver wins the $30 million Florida jackpot, he thought his life changed for the better. New houses, new cars, and rubbing shoulders with Florida's elite. Life seemed picture perfect. Two years later, he disappears without a trace. Was he finally enjoying his millions out in the Caribbean, or was something more disturbing at play? For weeks, detectives were left chasing their tail, trying to catch up to the millionaire. But one phone call in December of 2009 would break the case wide open and lead detectives to the last place anyone would think of. Finding out what happened to him exposed the lengths people will go to for greed. On November 15, 2006, the numbers 6, 12, 13, 34, 42 and 52 hit the Florida airwaves as the winning numbers for the $30 million jackpot. For many people, it was another wasted dollar. But for 40-year-old Abraham Shakespeare, an assistant truck driver, it was the win of a lifetime. He immediately moved out of his mother's home and got two brand new cars, a 2006 F-150 pickup and a 2007 BMW 750i. Everyone wanted to be seen with him. Barely three years later, Posters of his face started popping up around town, with a $5,000 reward for anyone who could provide information leading to where he was. The 43-year-old had disappeared along with his millions. Family and friends wondered where the millionaire had gone off to. Had he finally left like he always said he would? The answer to that question will shock everyone. On November 9th, 2009, Cedric Edom walked into the Polk County Police Station. There, he formally reported his cousin, Abraham Shakespeare, missing. A popular face around town and the winner of the 2006 Florida jackpot, people took notice. Throughout the summer of 2009, rumours swirled around as everyone wondered where Abraham was. Did he go on vacation? Was he running from the FBI? Or worse, was he dead? Family members reported receiving text messages from him written in perfect English. You might wonder why this would seem suspicious as Abraham was a US citizen. Abraham had an elementary school education, which left him limited in his reading and writing skills. This caused Abraham to avoid texting altogether. So how was Abraham able to text so well? Even with their suspicions about the texts, they gave him his space thinking he had become fed up with people begging for money all the time. Abraham was born in Lakeland, Florida on April 24, 1966. As an elementary school dropout, Abraham quickly started getting in trouble with the law. Over the next few years, he would be arrested for multiple crimes. At 29, Abraham decided to turn his life around. He moved in with his mother, doing odd jobs as a garbage man, pool technician, trucker and dishwasher, earning him about $8 an hour on average. With no money for a car, no access to a driver's license and no credit card, Abraham's one joy was buying lottery tickets. In 2006, Abraham got a job as a truck driver's assistant for MBM Corporation, a Lakeland food distribution company. On November 15th, he and a truck driver, Michael Ford, were making a delivery run in Miami. They pulled into a Town Star convenience store for some snacks. Michael got out of the truck and asked Abraham if he wanted anything. Abraham, with only $5 on him, knew exactly what he wanted. Two Florida Lottery jackpot tickets for $2. Days later, as the winning numbers were announced, Abraham Shakespeare found himself the winner of the 2006 Florida Lottery jackpot, a whopping $30 million. Abraham received a lump sum payment of nearly $13 million after taxes. His first major purchase was a million dollar house in a gated community in Lakeland. It was a major upgrade from his mother's house in rural Plant Town. For the first time in his life, Abraham had his own home with special additions of a pool and a two-car garage. Abraham also bought a Rolex watch. Abraham's day-to-day -day life did not change much since winning the lottery, as he still hung around his neighbourhood friends. The lives of those around him, however, changed drastically. Family and friends benefited from Abraham's generosity. 
He set up a million dollar trust for his child, gave his stepfather $1 million, his mother $12,000, his sister $10,000 and his three stepsisters $250,000 apiece. He paid off a friend's mortgage and gave his nephew's best friend $40,000. Abraham's generosity was not limited to just people he knew. Anyone that asked him for help got it. He paid off a $60,000 mortgage for a man whose last name he didn't know and another $53,000 mortgage for his neighbor. He paid for funerals, kept houses out of foreclosures and bought groceries. He even sent inmates a few hundred dollars after receiving letters from them. It wasn't long before more and more people gathered outside his mother's home, waiting for their share of his millions. Executives and top investment brokers tried to make recommendations on how to better manage his money, but Abraham didn't feel intelligent enough to understand what they were saying. Three months later, Abraham made headlines again, this time in a courtroom. Michael Ford, the co-worker who helped Abraham purchase the winning tickets, sued him. Michael claimed that Abraham stole the lottery tickets from his wallet. The jury didn't buy Michael's story and Abraham walked away with his millions intact. It would be three years before the millionaire hit headlines again. In late 2009, missing posters for Abraham appeared around town. It had been seven long months since anyone had seen him. As detectives talked to multiple people, one name kept popping up. Doris D.D. Moore. D.D. was said to be one of Abraham's closest friends. Detectives hoped she would be able to provide more information on the missing millionaire. Abraham and Dee Dee had met in 2008 through his Realtor. The 37-year-old introduced herself as an author interested in writing a rags-to-riches story about his life. She was inspired by his generosity and wanted to share his story with the world. Though the book was never released, Dee Dee took an important role in Abraham's life, managing his money and recouping loans he gave out. In a matter of weeks, Abraham introduced the 37-year-old woman as his financial advisor and debt collector. Detectives invited Dee Dee in for questioning. She told detectives she knew exactly where the millionaire was, safe in Jamaica, far from those who only wanted his money. I did everything to help the man. Dee Dee promised detectives she would tell Abraham to get in touch with them, but Abraham never reached out. When detectives questioned her, she continued changing her story. She claimed Abraham was in Puerto Rico, trying to avoid paying taxes and child support. Another time, she said he was sick. It seemed that Dee Dee did not know where he was. Shortly after questioning, Dee Dee sprang into action. She put out flyers, offering a $10,000 reward to anyone with information about Abraham. She also gave a three-hour interview explaining how she had helped him disappear and why. Dee Dee claimed by the time she met Abraham, he had a million dollars left to his name. To disappear, he needed more than that, so she bought Shakespeare's home for a little over half a million and filed paperwork to take over five mortgage debts totaling $400,000. She handed all the money in cash to Abraham to reduce any chances of a paper trail. Abraham, she said, was avoiding taxes and child support. She pleaded on live TV for him to return so the police would stop hounding her about his whereabouts. I have never hurt that man. He knows I would, everyone knows I would never hurt that man in any way. Did you murder Abraham Shakespeare? Absolutely not. Dee Dee handed over a video that she had taken of Abraham dated April 9th, 2008. In the video, Abraham complained about how tired he was of people asking him for money. They don't take no for a house or so. So where do you want to go to? It don't matter to me. I'm not a picky person. More people were convinced that the millionaire escaped for a more quiet way of living, but Polk County detectives were not so sure. We won't tell anyone where you are if you want to remain anonymous. We just want to close our investigation and go on to something else. To uncover the truth, they first had to uncover the truth behind Dee Dee and her relationship with Abraham. In 2001, long before Dee Dee met Abraham, she was found in a ditch in Waimama, Florida. She claimed that three Hispanic men had raped her at gunpoint, stealing her new Lincoln Navigator. Everything turned out to be a lie. Dee Dee was behind on car payments and planned a scheme to keep the car with some money on the side. She hid the car in a garage and got someone to tape her wrists. She threw herself from a moving car into the ditch. 
Investigators caught on and Didi was convicted of insurance fraud and falsely reporting a crime. Her sentence was a year's probation. Didi, however, did not learn her lesson and what she was about to do next would be much worse. In 2008, as everyone buzzed about Abraham's generosity, Didi decided she didn't just want a piece of the pie, she wanted everything Abraham owned. In November, Didi met Abraham's realtor, Barbara Jackson, while attending a conference. Their conversation soon shifted to Florida's jackpot winner and Barbara explained how Abraham's generosity had changed her views about money. Didi told Barbara she was a writer and would love to do a book about Abraham. A meeting was set up at his home two weeks later. Weeks down the line, Didi became concerned when she discovered Abraham had a little over $2 million left in cash and $3 million in assets. She told him he needed a financial advisor and helped collect debts owed to him. Didi was sure people took advantage of him because he couldn't read and write, so she took on the advisory role. Abraham trusted her and thought nothing of it when Didi placed documents in front of him to sign. Through this manipulation, she got Abraham to sign over his new mansion, create the Abraham Shakespeare LLC and remove himself from the ownership of the company. Didi owned a company called American Medical Associates, placing Abraham's assets under it. She bribed a police officer with $200 and a flight ticket in exchange for following her to Community Bank so she could take control of Abraham's bank account and safe deposit box. Didi drained his accounts. She withdrew a million dollars and brought herself a Hummer, a Corvette for her boyfriend, a truck and a Hawaiian vacation. She also bought a house in Plant City for $300,000, which she put in her boyfriend's name. By April 2009, Abraham grew suspicious of his financial advisor, as she wouldn't allow him to go to the bank. Abraham told his longtime friend, Judy Haggins, that he was going to the bank soon. Judy told Didi of his plans. By this time, Didi had dwindled his balance to less than $40,000. If Abraham found out, she would be arrested. It was at this point that Didi decided to rid herself of Abraham. On April 9th, 2009, Didi had lured Abraham to the property in Plant City and recorded him making statements about wanting to escape Lakeland. Later that day, she shot him twice in the chest with a .38 calibre Smith & Wesson handgun. Didi called her ex-husband, James, and asked him to dig a hole in her yard so she could bury some trash. On his way back home from digging, Didi called him back to cover the hole. He returned to fill it and went on his way home. For months after killing Abraham, Didi convinced everyone he was alive by using his phone to text relatives and friends. She would also pretend to receive calls from him when they were around. When she noticed Abraham's cousin Cedric needed money, she promised him $5,000 to give Abraham's mother a birthday card. Once the police started asking questions about Abraham's whereabouts, Dee Dee tried to cover her tracks. She approached the mother of Abraham's son and promised a $200,000 home if she would lie to detectives she saw him recently. The woman refused. On December 27, 2009, Dee Dee took Abraham's mother, Elizabeth, to dinner at Cracker Barrel. Elizabeth received a call from someone claiming to be Abraham, but he sounded nothing like her son. She reported the phone call to the police. They traced the number to a Greg Smith and located him in a mall parking lot and observed Dee Dee handing him something. Once she left, detectives hauled him in for questioning. She was like, everybody think I did something to Abraham and this and that. I said, well, listen, did you? No, Abraham's on his way back. Greg told detectives he owed Abraham $63,000 and met Dee Dee when she came to collect payment. She paid him $300 to call Elizabeth and pretend to be Abraham. It was clear Dee Dee was involved in Abraham's disappearance, but physical evidence was needed. Days later, Greg returned, claiming Dee Dee asked him to type a letter to Abraham's mother. Greg was able to get her on tape, reading out bits of the letter. You know, um, you were just like everyone else trying to talk me out of staying away. I don't know what I'm going to that one. He also joined her in dropping off the letter. The police picked up the letter. Don't worry about D, the letter read. There are too many people that know I left. I gave her enough money. She would not take anything from me unless I agreed. Detectives finally had some physical evidence. Days later, Greg revealed Dee Dee asked if he knew anyone who would admit to killing someone for money. 
Detectives told Greg to tell Dee Dee he had a cousin headed to prison for 30 years who was willing to take a murder rap for money. This was exactly what Dee Dee needed to cover her tracks and she took the bait. The next day, Dee Dee met with Greg's cousin, Mike Smith. He agreed to take the murder rap for $50,000. Dee Dee agreed. She provided him with specific details of the murder. She had no idea Mike Smith was an undercover cop. The following day, she handed Greg a .38 Smith & Wesson revolver, the same gun used to kill Abraham. She also gave him a map leading to where Abraham was buried. Hours later, police arrived on the Plant City property and began digging. Abraham's body was found buried five feet under a 30 by 30 concrete slab. Didi was arrested and charged as an accessory. While held on a million dollar bail, she continued to deny being involved in his death, claiming investigators had no proof that she had done anything wrong. But I'm telling you the truth about the guy being there and you don't You haven't not... told me the truth about anything yet. Nothing that we can prove. Come on, it's over. Investigators would soon prove her wrong. They acquired her phone's GPS, cross-referencing it with GPS from Abraham's phone. They discovered, beginning April 9th, Dee Dee and Abraham's phones were always in the same location. Two weeks after her arrest, Doris Dee Dee Moore was charged with first-degree murder. Behind bars, Dee Dee's story continued to fall apart. She claimed drug dealers had killed him. Then she accused her 14-year-old son. Finally, she claimed it was self-defence. The authorities were convinced that Dee Dee pulled the trigger. In a Hillsborough County courtroom, Dee Dee pled not guilty. Her outbursts during the trial shocked even the seasoned judge presiding over her case. She had breakdowns, screamed, cried, and made faces at witnesses in the courtroom. The judge often lost his patience with her, pausing court proceedings to lecture her. On December 10, 2012, Dee Dee Moore was convicted of first-degree murder for the killing of Abraham Shakespeare and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, with an additional minimum sentence of 25 years for possessing a gun in the course of a violent felony. Despite all the evidence against her, Dee Dee continues to maintain her innocence to this day. As for Abraham, what should have been a life-changing event in his life became the very thing that took it. He was once heard telling his brother, I'd have been better off broke. He had no idea how right he was.